Hello everybody, it's Kenneth from the Archives here with another video looking at items from our collections. Today I'm going to be speaking about items that come from our textile collections. Now, as you probably know, we have the largest collection of records relating to Dundee's famous jute and flax industries. We have the surviving records of all the big jute and flax firms that were based in Dundee, and it's a fabulous collection, uh, which we're very proud to hold. Um, we have masses of material, and I could talk for an hour or more easily without even scratching the surface of what we've got. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to be doing that. Instead, I'm going to be looking at a specific series of items. And the items I'm going to be looking at are some aerial photographs. Now, these aerial photographs were taken in 1922 and 1923 for Jute Industries. Jute Industries had been formed in 1920 when a number of the leading Dundee Jute firms, including famous names like Cox Brothers, J and E D Grimmond, Gilroy's, had come together to unite their businesses into a larger concern, which it was hoped would make it more competitive. And obviously, not long after that, the new business decided it wanted aerial photographs of its mills. There are several photographs in this collection, including some of Stanley Mills in Perthshire, but I'm just going to be focusing on a few today, which I find interesting and I hope that you'll find interesting as well. So the first one up is this. This is Belmont Works. This was the works originally home to Thomas Bell and Son, which became part of Jute Industries. And it's an interesting photograph. It shows the Jute works. But to me, it shows more than that. Because if you look at the architecture of Dundee, critics have often said that you get different types of buildings just randomly shoved together. You get grand residences beside industrial buildings. You get houses beside industrial areas. And you can see this here because in front of Belmont Works, we've got the spectacular Belmont House, uh, which you wouldn't expect to have a Duke Works in its back garden. And round about, we have rows of housing of various different ages. Another reason I like this one is this area has almost entirely changed today because Belmont Works would be demolished. And after the Second World War, this is the site that they would eventually get round to building Duncan of Johnson College of Art and Design on. Um, so this is part of the university campus area today. As I say, very few of the buildings survive, but one building does survive that is very significant, and that's the white building to the left of the works, because that is Hawk Hill House, which is the home to our museum services. Uh, that's where our colleague Matthew is based, uh, and it's a lovely building which we're glad to have as part of the university. Rather confusingly, though, the building next to it, just over here, was also called Hawk Hill House at some points in history. So if you see references to Hawk Hill House in the past, you're never always going to be 100% sure which one they're talking about. The other Hawk Hill House, uh, sadly, was demolished some years ago. So the next one I want to look at is a very famous Dundee Mill. It's Tay Works. Um, you're probably still familiar with this. It's famous for its impressive frontage, one of the longest frontages of any factory in Europe. It, and it is really stunning. And thankfully, a lot of it is still there and you can still see this. So it's it's a really nice idea. It gives you an idea of the scale of this. Tay Works was owned by the Gilroys, who were one of Dundee's premier jute manufacturers. Uh, you may also have heard of their famous house, Castle Roy and Brote Ferry. That sadly has long since been demolished. But this was one of the great works of Dundee, and you get an idea of how big it was. You can also see there were plenty of other jute mills around about. This was very much an industrial area. This picture is also interesting for what is on it at the other side. The road that the frontage of Tay works on, then called North Tay Street, nowadays been slightly realigned and widened and is now West Market Gate. Across from that, we can see the courthouse here. Now, the courthouse obviously still survives, but behind it is one of Dundee's forgotten lost buildings, and that is the old Dundee prison. Because, yes, Dundee did used to have a prison. And probably the most famous thing about Dundee's prison was the very last execution that was carried out there. And that was the execution of the Dundee wife murderer, William Henry Burry. Now, William Henry Burry attracts a lot of interest. His crime of killing his wife was a gruesome one, but it's not just for that, because he had come to Dundee with his wife just at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders in Whitechapel. 
and he had been in Whitechapel around the time those murders were thought to have stopped, or depending what you count as Jack the Ripper's murderers. And as a result of that, some historians and authors have suggested that Bury is a good candidate to be Jack the Ripper. So was this the place that Jack the Ripper was finally executed? Well, it's a good story, but as there is some evidence to support the claims that Bury was the Ripper, there's also an awful lot of evidence which might point in the other direction. But it's, 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 it's an interesting Dundee story. OK, here we see another two mills. At the top of the picture, we can just make out Bow Bridge Works, which was another major Dundee jute mill operated at this just before this time, before it became part of jute industries, by J and A D Grimmond. Grimmond's again a famous name in Dundee jute, Bow Bridge, one of Dundee's famous works. It was a very big one. The Grimmond's also, of course, known for one of their later family members after the family had left Dundee, Joe Grimmond, who, of course, was leader of the Liberal Party in the 1960s and 1950s. The other mill that's in the centre of the picture was Cauldron Works, and that was the mill operated by Harry Walker and Sons. Again, another big name in the Dundee jute industry. Now, Harry Walker is a familiar name because one of the Harry Walkers of the Harry Walker family, there was more than one, uh, but the most famous was Colonel Harry Walker, who commanded the 4th Red Battalion of the Black Watch Regiment, uh, the territorial battalion based in Dundee and known as Dundee's own. And Harry Walker led the 4th Battalion into action on the first day of the Battle of Lewes, when it suffered horrific losses. He himself was mortally wounded in the attack and died, and his death was much mourned in Dundee, uh, and his name is very much remembered until this day. Also, between the two mills, we can see Clippington Parish Church. And I point that out because it's slightly relevant to something we'll see in the next slide. Again, there's a lot of workers' housing we can see round about here, including Glamp Street, the other side of Cauldron Works, um, and that has all been demolished and renovated. So the area looks quite different today. The final slide I want to show, we're moving just a little bit along from Caldrum and Bow Bridge to look at a photograph that was taken to highlight the Angus Works. But it's not the Angus Works that's the most interesting thing in this photograph. The most interesting thing in this photograph are Dundee's famous football stadia. At the back, we see Dens Park, the home of Dundee Football Club. And to the right, we see Tannadice Park, the home then of Dundee Hibernians. They were just about to change their name to Dundee United, as they are known today. Uh, two very famous football grounds, famous, of course, for being the closest together in the UK. Uh, I gather there is one in there are two grounds in Hungary that back onto each other, which are officially the closest in the world. But you're not going to get much closer than Dens and Tanadice. And obviously, they've been built up extensively since then. Uh, and so they're very unrecognisable. We see another football pitch here. That's marked out on what was then Gussie Park. Um, that, again, is an area that has been redeveloped. We also see the famous Arkley Street allotments. And just at the front of the picture, you can make out another church. Well, that church was at that time, Clippington United Free Church of Scotland. I mentioned we had Clippington Parish Church in one of the earlier images. This was a result of when the Church of Scotland had been split uh, in the 19th century, and now the Church of Scotland was about to come back together at the end of the 1920s. So in 1929, there was a problem, because you couldn't have two Clippington churches uh, within relatively close distance of each other. That would just be confusing. So the old Clippington UF Church was renamed St James's Church, uh, although there was also a church, St James's and Brotty Ferry, so that did still cause a little bit of confusion. Uh, that St James's and Arkley Street, however, um, dis eventually dissolved, uh, and the building has now long since been demolished. OK, I hope you found these images interesting. We'll be back with another video soon. In the meantime, take care and stay safe. Goodbye.